Um, and warm greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand. My name is Ricky Harris um, and I'm an Indigenous researcher and public health physician based at the Irupomare Māori Health Research Centre at the University of Otago. Kia ora, my name is Sarah Jane Payne and I'm an Indigenous health researcher based at Te Kupinga Hauora Māori at the University of Auckland. We're both members of the NHS Race and Health Observatories Global Race and Health Group, um, and we'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to contribute to this very important event that particularly highlights racism as a global public health issue. Our research focuses on Māori health and the elimination of um, inequities using epidemiology as a research method and tool, and we work on a number of projects together. We're not policymakers, however, epidemiology plays an important role in providing evidence to inform policy. Unfortunately, it, it also has and continues to be undertaken in ways that are damaging to Indigenous peoples. So today we wanted to share our experiences and approaches to undertaking a more critical and Māori-centred approach to epidemiology that seeks to serve Māori needs um, and aspirations and our slides will be available following the conference. Māori are the Indigenous peoples of Aotearoa, New Zealand, making up 17% of the population. Historically, New Zealand was colonised by the British, with Crown governance formalised in the Treaty of Waitangi, signed between the British Crown and Māori in 1840. There are long-standing and significant inequities between Māori and non-Māori, with a seven and a half year gap in life expectancy and inequities across most health indicators, including health determinants, health outcomes and healthcare. These inequities are rooted in processes of colonisation and colonialism, supported by a system of racism, and are consistently patterned globally among Indigenous populations with similar histories. We consider health and social inequities experienced by Māori is a breach of Te Tiriti o Waitangi and Indigenous rights. Our understanding of Indigenous health inequities and our ability to act is informed by evidence that is created by health researchers, professionals and policy makers. Epidemiology has a powerful role to play here, guiding our strategic direction at local and national levels by producing data that informs policy and planning monitors progress, determines resource allocation, and identifies priorities within the health system. However, the potential of epidemiology to support Indigenous health equity needs to be questioned. Epidemiology draws heavily on statistical practices that were developed in support of white supremacy and the global colonial project, where Māori were viewed as subjects to be studied. Modern epidemiology creates harm when colonial beliefs about the inhumanity of Indigenous peoples are reflected in the collection and interpretation of health data and statistics. Epidemiology creates harm when it shapes health policy that neglects and even makes invisible Indigenous experiences of racism in society. Kaupapa Māori epidemiology grew out of our dissatisfaction with the state of Māori health and the exclusion of Indigenous power and voice in health research and decision making. Kaupapa Māori epidemiology is an Indigenous positioning and practice that has developed a critique of statistical methods and the role of the state in the production of Māori health inequities in Aotearoa. Understanding the link between Kaupapa Māori epidemiology and health policy means understanding the following Indigenous rights. The first right is the right to monitor the Crown. Kaupapa Māori epidemiology is a theoretically informed practice that recognises Māori rights to monitor Crown action and inaction in regards to Māori health and equity. In other words, Māori hold the power to monitor the state's obligations, responsibilities and responsiveness to Indigenous rights. Examining differences in health between Māori and non-Māori is a reflection of our treaty relationship. It does not mean that we aspire to be non-Māori, 
Rather, we view Māori health inequities as an indication of whether or not our Indigenous rights are being met. Kaupapa Māori epidemiology rejects colonial interpretations of Māori health inequities as somehow inherent to, our, to Māori individuals and communities, whether that be our genes, our bodies, our behaviours or our culture. Instead, we argue that achieving health equity for Māori requires a shift of the gaze towards the organisation of our societies and a structural analysis of the power systems that seek to oppress Māori and Indigenous peoples. This approach can also be applied to the development of health policy, encouraging a shift away from policies that aim to act on Māori individuals and communities to the development of policies that will address colonialism and racism as a basic cause of Māori health inequity in Aotearoa. The next is the right to be counted. Being counted is an acknowledgement of both existence and value. It means that one matters. Māori have the right to be counted and the right to identify ourselves as Māori. Māori health advocates, including Māori researchers and Māori policy makers, have long argued for high quality ethnicity data and health and population data sets as a Māori health right. It is fundamental for identifying and addressing ethnic health inequities. The failure of states to count Indigenous populations consistently and appropriately is not unique to New Zealand. In fact, New Zealand is often held up as a beacon of excellence in relation to ethnicity data. We have protocols for the standardised collection of ethnicity data and health, and it has been collected in health data sets um, for decades. However, it is not perfect. The quality, consistency and completeness continue to be problematic, particularly for Māori. Ethnicity data remains an area that needs advocacy, with recent analyses showing that Māori continue to be undercounted and health data by around 16 to 20%, depending on how it's measured. And that varies by age and gender. Ongoing systematic undercounting of Māori and health data, despite the existence of national standards is a policy failure. That has significant implications for identifying and addressing um, ethnic health inequities. This is a case where having a policy alone is not enough. To achieve high quality ethnicity data, requires continued commitment across the whole health sector and from the highest levels. And it must be attached to accountability mechanisms and ongoing quality assessments. The right to have a powerful voice. Māori have the right to recognition as a people, not a minority group, nor a subgroup whose needs are subsumed by those of the total population. These rights are pertinent to the design analysis and reporting of surveys. As a, as a quantitative research discipline, epidemiology can often, fa often favor numerically dominant populations and produce information more likely to benefit those groups in the development of policies and interventions. Māori voice or lack of it in research has been critiqued by Kaupapa Māori epidemiology and also developed and strengthened in relation to both research methods and broader research processes. Voice includes representation in the data itself, but also in the telling of the story of the data. In its simplest form, Māori voice means looking at Māori health and inequities. In this forum, this might seem like a really obvious thing to say, but to centre Māori, to prioritise ethnic inequities, you have to push back against total population approaches. A one size fits all total population approach does not work for us and it is not representative of our needs. But it is often still the default position for much policy related research and information. In New Zealand, this has recently been seen um, in the modeling of COVID and the modeling of the prioritization of medicines where there was a concerning lack of information for Māori. We also want and have the right to detailed information. The concept of mana whakamārama or equal explanatory power was developed from Kaupapa Māori epidemiology. It recognises Māori statistical needs as being equal to those of the total population and is operationalised through the recruitment of equal numbers of Māori and non-Māori in surveys, for example. It allows for both the examination of inequities 
and the analysis of data to the same depth and precision as non-Māori. And it influences both sampling strategies and recruitment strategies. In addition, Kaupapa Māori epi epidemiology also offers a tool to critique planned policies and interventions with regards to their responsiveness to Māori. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily require fancy designs or analyses. A recent example in New Zealand is the bowel cancer screening program. Māori have approximately the same incidence of bowel cancer as non-Māori. And a bowel, screening, a bowel cancer screening program is currently being rolled out to 60 to 74 year olds nationally. This was highlighted at the outset as inequitable by many Māori health experts due to the much higher proportion of Māori cancers likely to occur before the age of 60 compared to non-Māori because of our younger age structure. It was going to lead to increased inequities because non-Māori would benefit more. They argued for a lower start age for Māori and Pacific peoples. It's a simple argument based on um, basic descriptive epidemiology, but one that still encountered resistance, in part because the same data was not being looked at in the same way. Um, our government's actually recently announced an age extension down to 50 for Māori and Pacific peoples, after much effort by many Māori health advocates and others um, for a decision that really should have been uh, straightforward from the start. Some of the methods developed from Kaupapa Māori epi, such as equal explanatory power and age, standards, age standardization to a Māori population standard, can be easily taken up by a range of researchers, but this does not necessarily ensure safe research. Equal analytic power or the power of definition, explanation and meaning is also needed and means that Māori voice is not only important in the data itself, but also in relation to the researchers. Kaupapa Māori research explicitly considers research of positioning which influences the motivation to do the work, the questions that are asked, the methods that are used, and the story that is told. And finally, the right to name racism and colonialism. The attentiveness to history and context of Kaupapa Māori research supports the right of Māori to name the systems and structures of racism and colonialism. Kaupapa Māori epidemiology goes beyond mere description of inequities to explain and theorise the processes that drive health outcomes in equity, whereby racism is the health risk, not someone's race or ethnicity. Even the explicit examination of racism as a health risk should be critically examined in epidemiology. In New Zealand, individuals' experiences of racism are collected in our National Health Survey, again, highly influenced by many Māori health advocates. And that's excellent that our Ministry of Health does that, is really important. People should not have to experience racism and research shows that it leads to worse health. Uh, we've been involved in doing some of that work and I think it's been important in highlighting racism as a health risk. But racism and health research at the individual level has become dominant in epidemiology um, in terms of numbers of studies, in part because epidemiology lends itself to this type of research. And we must be careful that it's not conflated with individual experiences being thought of as the most dominant form of racism. And it's not that this type of research is not important, it is, but we still need to understand and explain these findings within the context of racism as a system and the interconnectedness between individual and structural forms of racism. Epidemiology cannot provide all of the answers. Other research disciplines are as important and more appropriate at times. Similarly, understanding racism broadly and how it operates via societal systems and structures is important in developing anti-racism health policy. The, ways that, the way that inequities are understood interpreted and framed has a bearing on the scope of the policies and programs considered for interventions. As Kaupapa Māori health researchers, we know and have seen that epidemiology has the potential to help. 
but when it is undertaken from an acritical and under-theorised positioning, it can also cause harm. The development of Kaupapa Māori epidemiology in Aotearoa was in part a response to this knowing and a recognition of Māori rights to excellent health research, health data and health policy. Kaupapa Māori epidemiology started from a place of unwavering commitment to Māori Indigenous rights and a love for our communities. It required Māori leadership, including thought leadership, and working together to effect change. We had to create Māori spaces to think deeply, talk about theory, and develop a critique of stats and epidemiology and how they uphold whiteness and privilege. Finally, we led projects that would test methods to better serve Māori and to look at the impacts of doing so. Although Kaupapa Māori epidemiology is a uniquely Māori way of doing research, we believe the concepts are applicable across nations, and many of the methods are straightforward to undertake. However, we have also seen that producing kaupapa Māori evidence is not enough to affect political change. White superiority is so deeply embedded in political and health systems that it operates to prioritise Pākehā power no matter what. And so we conclude this presentation by drawing on the words of race and health scholar, Professor Kamara Jones, who reminds us, and I quote, we need to name racism as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on so-called race. We must organize and strategize to act to dismantle the system and put in, put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. Kia ora. Thank you very much. And now I will introduce the chair of our next panel, um, Dr. Adrian uh, James. Um, and he is, has been the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists since 2020. His role will continue until 2023. And he leads the Royal C College of Psychiatry on behalf of its members and its associates. He's also a consultant forensic psychiatrist. Um, he is also former medical director of the Devon Partnership. And he also serves on the board of the Race and Health Observatory. Dr. James, please, and introduce the other panel members. Well, thanks, um, David. I just wonder if I can ask the rest of the panel to come up onto the stage. And I'll just um, say a little bit about um, my own view about the, the presentation and, and what it meant to me. I mean, before I do that, um, David, it, this is the first time I've actually met you in person. We've met online. Um, uh, you know, you're you're my, my hero. And uh, I... I went to a talk you gave at the NHS Confederation, it must be about six years ago, and I honestly, I left the room a different person, and you did a great honor in speaking at our International Congress recently, and uh, I said to everybody, you, you've, you've, got to, you've got to hear David speak. You honestly, if you, if you listen to what he says, um, it, it, it's put across in such an amazing way, you can't leave the room and not do something and that's how that was a real motivation for me so so thank you so i'm just going to ask our, our panelists to introduce themselves we've got a a, a, a mic um i don't we've got somebody online or are we we're a panel of of three are we um ha halima is no okay right well we are um we're a quality panel um but um yep. so uh, uh over to you heather hi um my name's heather nelson i'm the chief exec of a um what is now called a voluntary community and social enterprise sector back in the day it was their sector um and um we are very much into inequalities and inequities in education health and social care award-winning, I'm happy to say, and just being announced in the Queen's Honours List for doing excellent work within the communities. Um, my name is Andy Burness. Um, I'm a member of the uh, International Experts Group on Race and Health. Um, in my day job, uh, I'm a, uh, I run an organization that does communications for social justice, and I teach this. Um, and in addition, um, I, in, in the process, I tend to serve as an advisor and coach 
to um, advocates and scholars on how to communicate with the public. Great. Well, thanks, Heather and, and Andy. I just want to just say my own reflections uh, on data and, and looking at systems. I think d data is clearly very important, but you have to be very sensitive about how you collect your data, and you have to, you have to know what you're going to do with it. And people above all have to trust you. People won't be generous enough to give you information about themselves unless they know that you're not going to do bad with it and preferably know that you are going to do some good and they can actually see that. And that's been a problem for us. We're collecting much more data as the Royal College of Psychiatrists, but we know that there is a trust gap which we have to fill before we do that. The other thing I really wanted to say about, about systems and structural racism is that I think the days when you could you, you, people sat back and just responded to things that they came across or people pointed out, those days are over. We, we all have to be <coughs> proactive. We have to seek out everything, all the systems and processes, the structures within our organizations that have a differential impact on certain groups. And we have to be proactive in how we dismantle those. And that, that's a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to do. It's time consuming. You have to engage with, with communities and be sensitive to each individual need. But unless we, unless we do that, uh, we are, we're letting people down. And above all, I mean, it's, it's, it, there's a legal element to this. There's a moral element to this. But in terms of your organizations will not be as effective as they could be. So we're, we're letting down the people that we serve. And the Royal College of Psychiatrists, for example, is there for people with a mental illness. We're not there, we're not a club for psychiatrists. We are there for people with a mental illness. And unless we can make sure that everybody within the organization can give of their best, then we're letting those patients down. So this is a performance issue as well as a moral and a legal issue. So I don't know, Heather, will you just give us your reflections on, on what, you've, uh, what you've heard and, and your, your own take on, on issues to do with, with data and sensitivities around data and, and, and structures and, and how, we have, how we approach those? Okay. Well, before I go on, I just wanted to say I missed out that I'm a proud member of the Race and Health Observatory who organised this today, so I shouldn't have missed that out at all. Um, from what I heard and also from the video that we just saw, for me, data is collected on three bases. That's experimental, descriptive, and analytical. And when you look historically, and I'm again talking from the VCSE sector, Historically, when I, when I speak to communities, historically they have a mistrust, and I, I use the word mistrust because of experiences that they've had previously, so it's not a distrust, it is a mistrust. It's based on either their own experiences or historical experiences. And so it's very hard to get them to be involved in data collection because it's either misrepresented or misconstrued. And if you use the three examples of how we collect data, you would then have to ask yourself how or what methodology are we using as your baseline, as that ruler? And unfortunately, it's usually based on a Eurocentric way of analyzing things and collecting data. That in itself doesn't sit very well when you're looking at the diverse communities. So we need to have a look and see how we're collecting those da that data. And then what are we going to use it for? Again, the mistrust. Some of that information may be used in ways that people don't want it to be used. So we need to be upfront and honest. It's going to tell people what it's going to be used for, why it's going to be used, and where it's going to be stored. So the information that's collected, could it be collected anonymously? Um, that usually encourages people to take part in any research. And if it's not, where's their personal data going? We have to also understand that the communities that we have that make up here in the UK are very transient as well. So we have those that are not documented. If they are involved in data collection, how does that impact on them legally? We need to have a look also at those who are newly arrived and wanting to settle. We have so many different variants that we really have to be very careful on why we're collecting data and how we're going to use it. I could go on, but I'll pass on to, to yourself. Um, 
Thank you. Um, I feel like we're all being complimentary. I mean, I want to compliment you both, too. Um, but let, let, me, let me start by saying I've heard a, I've learned a lot today. I'm sure you all have. Um, but two things. One is there's been this theme of evidence is not enough. We just heard this at the very end, and we've heard this throughout. And our first speaker, uh, Lord Victor, uh, made the point of saying that the Race and Health Observatory is not a think tank, it's a do tank. Um, so I'm taking that thought and the last thought to say we're supposed to do something about this and evidence alone won't do it. So um, I thought it might be useful just to spend a few minutes because uh, David Williams, I'm glad you gave him these kudos, uh, Adrian, uh, whatever, a very well received talk and I thought, I, I warned him about this, I, I'm going to lightly deconstruct his talk. Uh, it's great risk, but I'm going to deconstruct why it's effective and encourage you all to think you can do this too. Not just to talk, but when you meet with policymakers, you meet with journalists, you meet with funders, you meet with collaborators, and you've got 15 minutes with them, how can you be the most effective person you can be to get what you want? So. Um, Without going into all the details, I'm going to say these things. It's key to have a good message. You leave somebody with a message at the end of the day, like what did this person say? And you can't say, well, go look at the PowerPoint for half an hour, or that's what they said. What did the person say? So it starts with data. It starts with evidence. And I call it, what's the problem? What's the data show? What's the context? And you got a lot of that in David's presentation, plenty of data there. Um, and, and mixed in with that is metaphor. So the notion that as many people die from racism and health as an airplane crashing into whatever um, is a metaphor. It's not a scientific statement, but it brings you in. And it's very, very effective. And, and a, a, good a good message deliverer can do that. The second thing is once you set the context, the audience wants to know, even if an audience of one, What's your solution? What do you propose be done? And you can't say, I don't know, I just have a lot of data. Because that's not too helpful. You have to say, well, let me show you four things that are happening. Third thing, the audience, and I want to get into a little more detail, but I will not take up too much time. The third thing is, what do you want me to do? What's the ask of that audience? So if you're meeting with a politician, that's one thing. If you're meeting with a journalist, that's another thing. If you're meeting with a funder, I want your money to do this, something specific that builds on the solution. And what needs to be done by whom? Not only what needs to be done, who needs to do it? Fourth thing is urgency. And that came up in the press. Why are we talking about this now? Why are we having this conference now? Why didn't we have it 20 years ago or 20 years from now? There's a reason why it's happening now, and it could have happened before, but there's a reason why the Race and Health Observatory was formed now. And so why is this group doing what it's doing, or why are you carrying your message now? What's the urgency for action? And the last thing that I think is really important is hope. Not that it's hopeless, not like, well, we just can't do anything about this. We have to feel like we can do something about it, but hope is built on precedent. They're doing this well here. And there were a couple of ex examples in David's talk, and there are other examples we can all think of that are like, well, they're doing that pretty well over there, even if it's an isolated thing. So building on hope, I, I think, is very important. Um, two, other, two or three other things to keep in mind. One is know who your audience is. The audience isn't the public. The audience is the audience you're speaking to. So if you're speaking to people who are already bought in, then that's one message. If you're speaking to people who um, aren't bought in and actually don't agree or aren't inclined to uh, agree, it's, is there any common ground on this? Is it, if it's not a moral argument, is it an economic argument? What sort of argument can you make that may not be your natural argument, but it's important to go to the audience where they are, not where, not where you are. Find out where, where they are. And the last thing I want to say is the messenger it's important that the messenger not just be the scholar, not just be the, quote, academic expert. The messenger has to be include people with lived experience. It must. And so the line of nothing about us without us really registers to me. 
That may not be sufficient. You may need the expert to back it up with data, but the expert has stories, has data, but the, the expert can't be the only messenger. So I'll start with that. Oh, well done. <laughs> I'm smiling because he just pinched my last thing, which was nothing Sorry. done with houses. <laughs> it, just, <laughs> it just means that we're thinking alike, and it's, it's very true. You know, nothing should be done to us without us. And, that, as, you know, it's how you, and again, what you just said, it's how you actually approach data collection will dictate how involved people will be. And we really need to have people involved so that we can collect not just the right data, but accurate data, so that it can inform us on the way that we go forward in the future. So I guess um, that, that's uh, fantastic um, contributions. And I guess along with, um, along with hope, you have to have vision. People have to be able to see how the world will look differently. I guess in the case of the Race and Health Observatory, the health world, how the world will look different in a better way if we do our jobs, uh, jobs well. So can I just ask each of you, before we open it to the, uh, the floor, what, what is the vision? What, 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 how will the world look five or ten years' time if we can get this right? So I'm going to dodge your question but answer it. I, do, I, don't think, I don't think this room has to say what the world's going to look like. I mean, the world's going to be more equitable. All these things we heard that are problems will be will be all disappear. I think we have to take a look at a big problem, a big, big problem, and chip at it. Little victories are not small. Little victories are not small. So if there can be a change in how, I, I, I shared this with David recently, my daughter's a nurse in the, at a hospital system in Washington, D.C., and they have changed the way they are screening for kidney dialysis patients to be less racist. That is one tiny, tiny achievement that's huge. So I think it's less how are we going to change the world as to what are the areas where we can actually make a difference and we go at them one at a time. And I think there is a domino effect. I think there's a ripple effect. If you can get three things to change, you can get 20 things to change. You can get a tipping point. Um, I, want, I, I want to add one other thing. You know, when we meet with people, the first thing, if you go into a meeting, somebody says, what can I do for you? We need to be prepared for an answer. Not like, well, I don't know, I can give you a lot of information. We need to be able to say, since you asked, if you really mean it, here's what you can do for me. And I think we need to be specific, and we ought to have that vision when we go into those conversations. Um, I agree. <laughs> But I also think as well is that, and again, speaking from the third sector perspective, is that sometimes we believe that it's the professionals that can make the difference. It's those with the qualifications, those with the big, long titles, when in essence, it's all of us. All of us can go to get to the same destination, but by different roads. And I think what we need to do is empower people, enable people to represent themselves to understand the systems. I also think the systems need to be more understandable as well. But you know, we need to enable and empower everybody to understand what's going on so that they can have an input, they can have a say. Once you have people investing, then they will be more likely to own. And if you, again, as a final thing, don't do anything without somebody being involved. And you cannot get them involved if you do not share the information and encourage that input from everybody. Great, thanks very much. Well, let's throw it open to the floor. Um, any questions? One right at the back, Steve. So this is primarily to Andy. So I, I love how you just phrased your question, uh, and the challenge to us, and, and partly what you're talking about is a trade craft of how actually we communicate where we are to where we want to go. And um, I, I've got a business outside of health and social care where I learned to do that, uh, and I use it every single day. How do we create the training in the vehicle so that actually what you're saying can be replicated? Because some of it is PR, some of it is about communication. And um, so I'm just curious about how we actually do that sustainably and 
you know, on a daily basis? Um, so I think, I think, I think this isn't a great answer. I think there's a baseline of training and teaching that anyone who's interested in being a better communicator probably has to go through. I don't think, you can watch videos. You gotta do something, you can't say I'm gonna. But once, you've, once you're pretty good, not great, but pretty good, then I think before you go into any encounter, any meeting of consequence where you want something, and I'm not saying the 10 a week, one, one every month, something like that, you have identify somebody who is, who's not an expert, a family member, a friend, and you say, look, I have an important meeting with a journalist, and they're gonna ask me about this. How's this sound? And get feedback. Don't talk from expert to expert. Talk to the audience, a type of person in the audience, or a generalist, or somebody who's pretty smart, but not too smart. Just somebody who is a regular person. But to get the baseline training, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what to say other than to, you know, g get it within your institution or find somebody who you trust or go on and watch a video or something like that. That's the answer for all of you as a, as a group. Okay. Heather, do you want to come up? Yeah, sure. I think we all know that communication is important. I think what we sometimes fall into is a trap of elitism by the language that we use. Yeah, so instead of include, being inclusive, we're actually becoming more exclusive by the jargon, the um, acronyms, etc. I know there's a term about use layman terms, but for me, it's use just everyday English so that everybody knows what we're speaking about. And we're not excluding anybody either deliberately or accidentally. The whole thing is about being inclusive. Communication can either be the barrier or it can be the gateway into anything and everything that we do. And that's both verbal and nonverbal. Um, so yes, I think yes, training, but in a different way as in with your counterparts, but also going back to just basic English and let's just use that so that we can encourage everybody to speak with um, each other. Because I do know that's what some communities members say, they've got lots to say, but they don't want to say it just in case they're using the wrong terminology or the wrong, wrong words, etc. And that's about those who are professional, just being more open and understanding that they don't want to use their language as a barrier. I mean, I've always thought that if you, uh, if you can't keep think things simple, you quite often don't know what you're talking about yourself. <laughs> and if you're, uh, it's, it, it's, it's simple ideas that actually work. You know, if it's, if it's too complicated, it'll never, never take off. Um, I think we had a Is question near the, saying, front, actually, yeah, near the front, actually. Keep it stupid. We got the microphone. Oh, sorry, down, oh, five minutes uh, to go. Yep, but um, microphone at the front here, please. Thanks. Thank you. Um, just to go back to the presentation made by the two professors earlier, um, I just want to say congratulations and thank you to them because what they're doing is tr challenging traditional methodology. And in science, we know how difficult that is. And to see that they can do it and they have done it differently uh, is quite heartening. Um, and I just wonder you know, what the consequences are if other communities do that and argue that this particular methodology that we've established, it's a traditional methodology, we've used it in science, and now to do it differently, how that would feel and how that would be received. Thanks. Heather, do you want to? Oh. You want to go? Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, you, you, Heather, Heather first. Heather first. <laughs> um, I think we can all learn from each other. I think we can all learn the, the positives and also learn from the negatives because you can build from, you can build a lot from what has gone wrong previously. I think having a conference like this enables us to share globally things that we otherwise might not have known or might only have read about, but to actually hear it and it be presented to us enables, well, it enables me to digest it better and go away thinking, ah, that's a good way of doing something. That's a good methodology. And I think when, when we're sat and we're actually talking amongst each other and, uh, and, and sharing, that's a good way of learning. 
not everybody is very good at looking at and reading, you know, long reports, etc. Listening to the two professors that were just talking about the different ways that they've managed to turn around their, their research and the methodology speaks volumes. It shows that those who often call communities marginalised or minorities or other words that are not so pleasant actually <coughs> can see that those groups that they're speaking about can actually be the ones who can make the change rather than the change being made for us. So again, it's that inclusivity and valuing diversity and valuing difference. Go on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, your question reminds me of um, a time when I was working. I, I was involved in the, uh, the, trial for the, the clinical trial for the malaria vaccine in Africa. And I was training one of the scientists from Ghana about how to communicate about the vaccine. And he was really reluctant to have training. He, had, he was really scared, like, this is going to be no fun. And he told me before he started, I would rather have an eye gouged out than go through this whole horrible process. So I told him that he would feel better as I would be fine, and that we would go through this process and he'd be fine. And he was, and I would say that to get from here to there, it's in, th there's good news and bad news. The bad news is it's a different language. You have to speak it, you just have to speak the way you were saying, in very clear, simple language with stories and the rest. The good news is it's not a hard language to learn. So you can do this, so. Okay, just one final question. I think one at the, the back, um, yeah. Can we just do an online question quickly from oh, someone okay. from yeah, the audience fantastic. online? Yeah. So Dr. Deepak says, um, can the panel suggest hints and tips on how to blend one's own lived experience and professional expertise and share enough but maintain a line on your privacy so your privacy isn't just open season? So you can just re repeat the question again. Sorry. Sure. Um, Dr. Deepak is asking, um, can the panel suggest hints and tips on how to blend one's own lived experience and professional expertise and share enough but maintain a line on your privacy? This is where my simplicity comes into play. You can share lived experience anonymously, or you can share to various levels. So you don't have to give everything about yourself, but you can give general, what's the word? General information. Um, I don't think it's that hard to actually share your lived experience. It's about how far into your privacy you personally want to go. I, I, I'm going to quote you, I agree. <coughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I can, I can answer that just uh, briefly. I, clearly, I don't have um, lived experience of racism. That's, I think, pretty, pretty obvious. But I, I, um, I'm a psychiatrist, and I've spoken about having had a mental illness myself. And uh, the way I keep my boundaries is that when I'm I in a treatment situation with a patient, I don't disclose things about, I don't get into a conversation about my own mental health or the fact that I've had a mental illness. But those very same people I might see in a different context and I'll give a talk and I've done a lot of work. I set up an organization uh, working with people with lived experience. I'm, I'm one myself and about um, breaking down professional and lived experience um, uh, boundaries that I would, I would talk very openly about that. But sometimes people will think, well, should I, should uh, they feel under pressure to talk about their lived experience? I think you should. You it needs to be safe to talk about your lived experience of w whatever it is. You you shouldn't feel under pressure. There's often the right time and the right place in order to do that. But I think the question is a good one because you do have to keep your boundaries as w as as well, and it has to be safe. Anyway, I think that's the end of our session. I think we've got a couple more sessions to, to come. I'd really like to thank David for introducing the session and, uh, and Andy and Heather, a uh, fantastic panel, and thank all of you uh, for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.